Hi, good evening everybody. So tonight's live stream is about osteitis pubis, which is a painful condition um, that runners and footballers and anybody who does impact sports like those can get. Um, what I'm going to talk about tonight is I'm going to discuss the symptoms, how do you know you've got it, um, the diagnosis, how do they establish what it is exactly, uh, what causes osteitis pubis to develop in the first place, uh, recovery times, what you can expect, then we're going to look at treatment and specifically at the end of it I'm also going to go into the exercise that um, works for curing this disease. So I'm going to try, I'll go into a bit of detail as far as I can. Now, if you're new to these live streams, first of all, let me tell you who I am. My name is Mareka. I'm a sports physiotherapist and I'm the physiotherapist from sportsinjuryphysio.com where you can get online physiotherapy treatment for your injuries. Um, if you're new to the live streams, you can ask questions as I go along. I'll keep an eye on the comments. Sometimes I forget to look at the comments, um, but I always come back and answer them. If you're watching this on replay, then please feel free to um, ask questions as they come up. And if you tag me, then I'll definitely get them. So yeah, let's get going. So let's look at the first thing. So symptoms of, osteo, um, of osteitis pubis. It's basically, there are quite a few different aches and pains you can get with it. Sometimes the pain can come on gradually over time that you start noticing it. Other times, it's as a sharp pain that you first feel it and then it just continues. Now, the pain can be, actually, I want to stand up and just show you. It can be, so this is where your pubic symphysis is, where the main injury will be. Your pain can be there, but it can also be into the groin, up into the abdomen. It can really transfer into that. It can transfer down into the adductors and into that and sometimes come right round into that bit as well. So it's not that it has to be just over the front of the pubis. It can be all around there and it can really refer right in deep into the buttock as well. For men, it can also refer into the scrotum. Um, so yes, it can cr create quite a different um, variety of aches and pains. Now, the intensity of the pain can vary as well. If it's really acutely flared up and you've really annoyed it and not calmed it down um, when you felt it the first time, it can keep you awake at night, it can be painful at rest, sitting can be painful even. Um, for other people, when it's just starting to flare up, it may only be painful after exercise and then calm down after a few days and you can exercise again, but then it flares up again. Um, or it can be that it slowly, slowly builds and you have to stop your training session because it just becomes too intense. So there's a wide variety depending on how far the injury has progressed. And it's useful to discuss the diagnosis and causes in combination with that because then you'll understand why that is. Now, I also have to say sorry for my husky voice tonight, but I've had laryngitis. So if I start coughing in a minute, I've got my water just here. Um, <clears throat> so if we look at the diagnosis, what and what is osteitis pubis? Oh, that's the wrong one. Let's start with this. So if you look at the pelvis, that's a X -ray, regular X-ray of your pelvis and it's of a normal pelvis. So you'll see where the yellow arrow is pointing. That is your pubic symphysis. So that's where your pubic bones come together and there's a cartilage um, disc in between them that sits in there. Because remember, especially females, we've got to give birth. So that has to be able to separate during the birthing process and then come back together. And you can see the things I want you to note there is, yes, there's a space and that's because the disc is there. That space is narrow here. It can be a little bit wider on other people, but that's how it looks. And look at the very nice regular line there. There are quite sharp lines. You can see exactly where the spaces end. And then the other thing to note is the bone is kind of, there's a bit of white in the bone, but it's also a bit of dark. There's nothing standing out specifically there. Now, if we look at two x-rays of people with osteitis pubis, if you look at the top one first, can you see how irregular it looks as if something's chewed on the bone there? Also, it's got quite a large space at the bottom there. So you can see how the bone has worn away in that bit. And also for the bottom one, you can see how irreg irregular that um, joint line now is. Taking you back to this one, if you look at that one, 
it's beautiful and, and straight lines whereas that one looks as if a, a moth's eaten it and there's also a bit more white in that area showing inflammation now one way to diagnose osteitis pubis is by doing x-rays like these because they can show you the bone changes but it's also useful to do an MRI scan because this condition is not just about the bone yes the pubic symphysis gets worn out because of all the impact and things you've done but you also end up often there's a combination of tendinopathy in the adductor tendons so where they attach right there into let me just show you on myself again oops which way do i go so pubic symphysis is just there okay and into the groin you've got your adductor tendons attaching there they can have a tendinopathy and often your stomach muscles come and attaches to the top bone there and that can actually also create a tendinopathy because all of that area usually strains with this condition so an mri scan once you see this on x-ray it's useful to have an mri scan as well to see the extent of what's going on there now diagnosis is not made purely on x-rays and scans you also your physiotherapist or doctor that you see will listen to your history it's often when we think of runners it's runners that does a lot of long distance and impact running so your ultra distance athletes or people who you may only be running um, regular marathons but maybe you've just piled on the mileage too quickly or you've done too many of them in a row and you maybe haven't built up to that over years because um, it's an overuse injury it's basically about repetitive impact without giving it enough time to recover um, then also your footballers can get it quite often because there's a lot of twisting a lot of high impact in there um, another part of the diagnosis is about the symptoms listening to where the symptoms have come on how it's come on gradual versus sharp if it came on with a sudden kick of a ball then likely you want to exclude tears and things first before you think about this also you get a condition with very similar symptoms that's actually inflam um, uh, infection of the pubic bone um, which if you if you've got a fever or something like that that may indicate that you've actually got an infection rather than pure osteo osteitis pubis um, like I've said x-ray and MRI scan can be useful for the diagnosis here and you want to be looking at the pubic symphysis that's the main one that tells you it's this condition but then you can have a tendinopathy in your adductor tendons as well as your rectus abdominis those three things often go hand in hand and that's why the pain can spread why it can be on the inside of the groin it can be high up into the stomach you can feel it in quite a few different places um, so let me just see where we're we moving on to next okay so the causes the first and main cause for this injury is overuse and it's about a very high training volume a lot of high impact without enough recovery time and it's often not just a short period of time that you've done it it may be a whole year's worth of training that you slowly slowly built up that you just did not give enough recovery that you did too many ultra races in that year or things like that um, combine that with poor nutrition and things then you even get a, a, a more impressive impact on that muscle imbalances if you've got weaknesses in your um, certain stability muscles around that area absolutely it can cause an overstrain of that but so if you think of your um, gluteal muscles that's meant to support your pelvis as well as your hip joint if that's not strong enough on the outside it can cause things to strain on the inside um, movement patterns if your leg collapses excessively or your pelvis drops excessively when you runs that can potentially cause uh, overstrain with that um, there's some research that shows flexibility or lack of flexibility can contribute to this I have to say at this point that the true and only cause of osteitis pubis has not been determined through the research there's a lot of research to show that this or that or that can help but then there's a few studies that will show yeah actually with these cases that wasn't the case so there's no clear reason and I think the reason for that is because this area is where a lot of your force or most of your force when you're on put one leg down as you run crosses through the pelvis in that area so 
I think it's more a combination of things that often brings it on rather than one clear cause, as is with most injuries, to be honest. So that's why there's not a clear, clear cause. Um, so for some people, flexibility may be an issue, but other people may be hypermobile. Um, so there's less stability. So it doesn't mean that if you've got this condition, you always have to stretch or you always have to strengthen. It can be that you actually just need to look at your training load that you did. Um, and then there are reasons unrelated to sports. So I already mentioned hypermobility. Um, that's when your ligaments are really lax. So you need really strong muscles to help stabilize your joints. Um, and it also means that your joints can take more strain than other people's joints can. Um, often after childbirth, women can have trouble with this because let's face it, especially if it's a difficult delivery, things will strain for babies to move through that area. Um, so yes, there are loads of other reasons that can cause this as well. Then if we move on to recovery time. Now, it is an overuse injury and it is an injury where there's a lot of um, changes that takes a long time to turn around. And you're lucky if this condition settles within six months it's more likely that it takes up to a year or longer to fully get you back to your full training again. Now, that doesn't mean that if you just sit on the couch for two years, you're going to be fixed. No, you've got to try and find the right level of exercise to strengthen yourself up during that time. And finding the right level of exercise can also significantly actually decrease your recovery time that you can take quicker to get back to what you want to be doing. And you'll see in the green there, the quicker you seek help, the faster your recovery. And that has actually been shown in the research that the people who had a longer period of symptoms before they looked for help, they are the guys who have who really struggled to get back to their normal running, who has to have the injections um, and even go on to surgery often. So if you're getting any type of groin, prep, groin pain, my advice to you would be, Go and seek medical advice as quickly as possible. And don't go and see your GP because GPs aren't really um, geared up for this type of injury. I would really go and see a physiotherapist, um, especially somebody who focuses on sports injuries could be useful. Except if you got this condition from childbirth, then seeing somebody who specializes in antenatal and things like that could be more useful. Um, or see a sports physician. Sports physicians are excellent at um, diagnosing conditions and getting the diagnosis right. And once you've got that diagnosis, then they often also know knows the best person to refer you to for your rehabilitation and for getting you better. But do not postpone it. Definitely go and seek help um, quickly. Okay, so then we get to treatments. There is no one size fits all for this condition, but what I will say is the one thing that everybody needs is load management. Now, what do I mean with load management? It means that you immediately have to decrease the loads through that area to get it to recover. So remember, this is an overuse injury. So you have basically used that tissue to the point where you haven't given it enough recovery time. So it's go, gone down into a little bit of a breakdown phase. So now you have to unload it for a period of time to help build it back up. But when I say unload, it doesn't mean use crutches and don't walk at all. It means that you decrease the load to the point where it doesn't aggravate, aggravate your sim symptoms and you can get around without it increasing your pain. As it calms down, you can do more and more and more because the tissue will cope with it and it will get stronger. So load management means bring down that load dramatically to the point where it doesn't hurt and then slowly start building it up at the rate that your body allows you to. And this is probably one of the reasons why it's useful to work with somebody who's, who specializes in sports injuries and stuff because what they can do is they can look at your program and they can really listen to the symptoms and things and help you put things in perspective and gauge things accurately to decide what things are not useful to do at this point and what things you can carry on with. What I will say is if you've got this injury, it's really devastating because it does take a long time. But you will do yourself a favor if you have any races and things booked for the rest of the year 
just cancel them because otherwise what's going to happen is you're going to try and get force your rehab to get you better within that certain time frame and especially with this injury if you have to pull back and take it slower for a couple of months you have to take it slower if you're going to try and push to get fit enough to do your race or something you're going to overstrain it again and you're going to really prolong your recovery period so it's a very difficult decision to make but just decide that you're going to focus a hundred percent on rehab and go and cancel everything else that involves impact activity even if it's a fun holiday that you've got planned like climbing a mountain or going for a long hike just cancel all of that for now and stick to exercise that is um that doesn't put weight through that area so we're thinking cycling we're thinking spinning you can get really good workouts through spinning um swimming rowing anything like that could work that doesn't cause um big in force um uh, in force? What on earth does that even mean? <laughs> Big, large forces through the pelvis in that area. Now, the second thing is compression shorts. Seems The research seems to back that up. Um, you'll see if you go on the internet and you Google compression sh shorts for um, osteitis pubis, you get loads of different types. They definitely help for pain management. They do not really increase your level of function. So what that means is when you wear them, you can do things without pain, but it doesn't mean that you can run more than what you could run without them, if that makes any sense. Sorry, voice just needs some water. <clears throat> so yes, especially if your condition is quite painful and you're getting pain day to day, it may be worth getting some of those compression shorts and just wearing them under your clothing. Um, physiotherapy exercises or strength training is probably the except for load management that and load management are the two main main important things you have to get right because what we need to do now is once you have an injury the capacity of that tissue to deal with forces when you're running or when you're playing football or when you're walking dramatically falls so where it could cope with a 5k or 20k run it can now just cope with walking to the shops if that makes sense so now as the tissue gets better and your injury recovers, we've got to slowly strengthen it back up to get the capacity of the tissue up so that it can cope with the loads you want to put through it. If you just rest it and you just unload it, you won't change anything. Because think about it. The only way I can build muscle is going to the gym and doing some weights. I'm not going to get a beach body by lying on the couch. I have to slowly build it back up. It's important to get the exercise bit right because if you jump in with exercises that strains that part too much and it's not strong enough at the moment for that, then you will make the injury worse and you will make your pain worse. So that's why I'm going to talk about that in a lot of detail in a minute. Okay, so hang on for that. The fourth point there is hands-on treatment. And what I mean with that is um, things like massage, dry needling, acupuncture. <coughs> Um, laser therapy, ultrasound, all of those things. They are really useful to help relieve feelings of tightness and pain and make you more comfortable. They are not going to fix your injury. You've got to understand that. For that, you need load management and you need strength training. But they can make you a lot more comfortable. So if you've got a physiotherapist or somebody you go to, it is useful for them to do deep tissue massage or stuff for you um, because it will help with your pain. But it's, you have to do the exercise as well. That's the thing that's going to fix you. The massage and things is kind of like the cherry on top. And to be honest, you don't have to have it. You can do it yourself. You can do some rolling and things like that. Um, and it's not going to speed up your recovery either. It's just going to make you feel more comfortable. Then steroid injections. They can be useful for some people, but it's important not to have them too quickly. And the reason for that is that corticosteroids actually decreases the healing response. Now, remember, this condition is already a condition where healing hasn't taken place. It's an overuse injury. So we're trying to get that stuff to heal and it doesn't want to heal. And what the research shows is that you're better off if your conservative management of exercise and load management just does not get you anywhere then after six months or so of that you can consider a corticosteroid injection 
but people do better if they've had the condition for a very long time and then do an injection. The ones that get the injection early on don't actually recover that well. So do not go for the injection and think, oh, if I kill the pain, I can get on with things. It has a long-term effect that you don't want. Unless you're making progress, then the injections can be really useful. Okay. The second type of injection that the research has shown can be useful is a prolotherapy injection. That is actually where they inject um, a high sugar-based, I think it's sucrose that they inject, sugar-based injection. And the sugar irritates the joint and it makes it fuse. So for f some people, that's really useful. They also do it for sacroiliac joints sometimes. And what that does is it just creates more stability in that pubic symphysis. But again, it's not a first line treatment. It's something if the other things does not work, that is worth trying. OK. And lastly, there's surgery. So if you look at the research for the steroid injections, roughly 50% of people who's had prolonged osteoitis pubis and not responded to other therapy responds to steroid injections. 50% doesn't or don't respond to it. Um, and for them, surgery may be an option. And again, surgery can be that they go in and clean things out, um, clean some of the tendons that may be irritated off, um, but that may not work for, for everybody either. So sometimes they go and they fuse the pubic bones together and that can work for some people. None of this has a 100% success rate, but if you, ser if you look for treatment and advice and the right advice early on, your chances of recovering through load management and just exercise is much higher than having to go through everything else. Okay. Good. So remember, let me know if you've got any questions, even if you're watching this on replay. So then if we move on to exercise. Now, when we talk about exercise, there's strength training and there's flexibility stuff. And I better talk about the flexibility stuff. I've put it at the bottom there, but I'm going to mention it first because otherwise I may forget. Not everybody gets this condition because they're overly tight. So it's worth testing and it's really easy. I do it with all my online patients, just checking how flexible the hips and things are and how flexible your quads are. So when we look at flexibility, we want to look at internal rotation, external rotation of the hip. So how far can it move in? How far can it move out? Is one side equal to the other? Now there's a large variation between what people should be able to do. Um, but yes, it's just about not being overly tight in those movements. Then also a very important one is how tight are your hip flexors? Are you able to get your full extension of your hip about 10 degrees or so plus um, easily bend your leg back? So let me show you what I mean with that. Um, so if I can make this lower a little bit without. So are you able to grab hold of your, your foot without having to do that or this being stuck there. If your leg is stuck there, it means your hip flexors are really tight. You've got to be able to bring it back without your pelvis coming forwards because that is now me just allowing my pelvis to come forward. So my back's got to be straight. So there are very easy ways of testing these things. Um, so yes, if you find your hip flexors and things are overly tight, then flexibility exercises may be a useful thing to throw in here. What I will say is if you have a lot of pain in your groin, especially in your adductor tendons, be really careful not to stretch them at the beginning because stretching tendons that's inflamed or painful or has a tendinopathy in them can often make the pain worse. So stretching the hip flexors and the glutes and stuff may be a safer option to start for with rather than going in and stretching those adductors severely. Okay, now strength training. We're looking for strength um, around your core as well as your, um, your hip stability, as well as basically all muscles around the top of the thigh. So not just the adductors, we're looking for strength in the quads, we're looking for strength in the glutes, especially the glute meat, glute max, the adductors as well as your core muscles because all of that works as a unit to stabilize the pelvis and the hips. You have to do strength training 
at least three times a week with us. Um, not more than that, because remember, again, you need recovery time. So you can't do strength training for that area two days in a row because you'll just overtrain it and then you'll end up with more pain. You've got to allow, allow enough recovery. If you're really weak, you may only get away with twice a week. So again, it's useful to work with somebody who can dis decide what is the best rhythm for you to do your strength training and things. We're looking for, like I said, stability training. So you'll look at movement patterns, like with a squat. Does your knees move in line with the middle of your foot, with the middle of your hip, that they're not f moving in or out and squashing the groin area there? You're looking for pure strength in those muscles and things as well. Now, don't confuse the fact that I'm saying strength training with thinking that you have to go in heavy. Because if you're going to go in with heavy, heavy weights at the beginning, you may actually make things worse. For instance, if you also have a tendinopathy in your um, rectus abdominis, your stomach muscles, if you're going to go and do sit-ups, often that makes it feel worse. So the safest place to start is with isometric exercises, which means you just hold the position. So an easy isometric exercise for the stomach muscles, for instance, would, would be a plank. And you start with short holds that you don't hold it to the point where you aggravate your pain. Um, the plank's actually a nice one because it also gets the, the hip flexors to an extent and the, fronts of the front part of the adductor muscles. An example of uh, isometric exercise for the posterior part of the adductors and the, the hamstrings and stuff is uh, isometric glute bridge. And of course, a side plank um, would really get the abductors, so the side of the, the hips, but also do a side plank with your hips, legs straight and feel how hard your adductors have to work. So that's a way to strengthen them at, as well at the beginning. So I usually start my patients with isometric exercises. They have to be done pain free for this condition. That's my own opinion. You may have a different one. <coughs> but I do find that if you push into pain with this condition, you end up just flaring it up. Then I take people through doing exercises where they do them on double legs. So if we're thinking about squats and deadlifts and stuff like that, before I move them onto single leg, because single leg starts to put a rotation force through that pelvic area as well. <coughs> Sorry, I think we're at the end of what my voice wants to do tonight. Um, so yes, I would usually work people with double leg squats and things first starting with low load, maybe body weight first and build that up. And as soon as I find they can tolerate single leg work, I'll start with that, but I'll start with nice supported things. Um, and be careful of doing heavy lunges and stuff because a lunge really puts a rotation through, force through the pubic symphysis. So if you're gonna start with lunges, start with static lunges and just kind of dip in, dip up and always respect pain and just ease into it always keeping in the back of your mind that you're building the capacity of the tissue up. You're building the strength of the tissue up. It doesn't matter if today you can't go all the way down. Just do it to the point where you can do it and eventually your body will get used to it. It will strengthen up for that range and you'll be able to do more. Okay. Then we start from stable exercises to more dynamic things. What that means is you'll be doing your static squats, your, your static lunges, then you'll go into dynamic lunges, into directions, and you'll also go into jumps and plyometric stuff. If you're doing football, if that's the sport you're getting back to, you're going to have to add in twisting motions and things as well, and kicking motions eventually. But that all has to be taken from really easy levels to more heavier and faster levels eventually, and from low impact to high impact. Now, at the beginning, you won't be running until you've got your base strength there. If you can hop without pain, usually I say, okay, fine, and you don't have pain with your other daily activities, then it's time to try a run walk. But you have to kind of tick a few boxes of base strength and base exercises that you can do first before you can start running again. Remember what I said about if you've got any courses or any, um, uh, what I mean, any competitions or anything booked for running or triathlon or anything like that, 
please cancel them because otherwise it's going to make you run before you're ready for it. Because with the running even, when we get you back to running, it'll be little tasters to first see what the 24 hour response is of that. Because often it's only 24 hours later that you under that you feel, oh no, I've actually aggravated that pain again. Excellent. So that is basically my preach for the evening. Let me know if you've got any questions. Remember, if you need any help with any injuries, you're welcome to consult me via video call. I'll put a link to my website in the description of the video. And yeah, if you're watching this on replay, please ask questions. I'm always there and you can either message me on Facebook or you can email me through my website or you can just ask in the comments. Take care, guys. Bye bye.